Uh, may I um, be humbled and, and decrease, Lord, and, and I pray that your word and your truth would increase. So we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So another story of, um, I don't know, well, Potiphar's wife. Maybe you've heard this story before, but we saw some things last week with Judah and, and Tamar, his daughter-in-law, and uh, it's shady. There's some sordidness in that, and we've seen some stuff in the previous chapters too. But this is refreshing because, uh, because Joseph, you know, he, he does what's right. He doesn't fall. And, and there's a lot of sin. There's a lot of, you know, our human condition throughout Genesis for sure. Obviously, the first sin with Adam and Eve and, and rebelling and turning from God. So we've seen that, and we've seen the condition of fallen humanity, and we see how sin increases. So it's nice to kind of see a win, if you will, in this. So I think that's one of the things I appreciate of this chapter and of, of the story of Joseph. Um, but what we see is after Joseph has been sold into slavery and brought to Egypt, we see now that his status, if you will, and, and his job, if you will, is, is an Egyptian slave. That, that's, that's his role now, and that's what his circumstances has, has led him to. Um, for perhaps maybe a, a less... Uh, Believing person, for one who doesn't find their identity in Christ, it would be easy for him to assume this is now his lot in life. You know, this is who I am. I am a slave. I've been betrayed by my brothers, you know, um, my own flesh and blood, and now I'm here in a foreign territory, and now I'm serving under foreign people, and I'm a lowly slave. Right? So this is who I am. This is what become, has become of me. That could have easily become his identity, but we will see that that isn't the case. Um, now, he could have also questioned a lot of what was happening, right? I mean, ugh, fate, or this is just terrible luck, or, you know, what, what's going on? Why, why, why? But we also know behind the scenes that this is part of God's sovereign plan, right? And we'll see that more clearly. Um, God's sovereign plan, even though he is at this time an Egyptian slave, is being carried out in his life, but not only for him, but for God's greater purpose, for God's covenant people, not just Joseph, right? But for the people he belongs to, for not just the family he belongs to, also that's part of it, as we will see, but also for the people of Israel, God's covenant people that he has made this promise to, to Abraham, to, to Joseph's, you know, uh, forefathers, right? Um, so we see that, too, behind the scenes. We, we, we see that above what's taking place in the circumstances. But nevertheless, I think for a... Uh, Teenager, because that's what Joseph was. So he's older than all of you here, probably. Uh, he's probably maybe 17 at this time. Um, you know, this would have been difficult, perhaps even, you know, traumatic again, you know, being sold. Um, even actually, remember, he was, his, his brothers actually first wanted to kill him, right? So actually, I guess being sold was, was the better of the two options. Um, but being taken away far from his, you know, home, and, and uh, now he's a slave to this, uh, captain of the guard named Potiphar. Um, and before this, remember too, Joseph had actually had a life of, I think we could assume privilege. Um, you know, coming from a well-to-do family because Jacob had been blessed. Um, and also he was extremely favored by his own father as well, right? Remember that a couple weeks ago as Pastor Brian was sharing? He, 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 the favor that his father unashamedly showed him and the way that he treated him differently was on full display with the uh, special cloak that Joseph got, you know, the, the technicolor cloak, the, the robe of, of many, you know, rainbows and all these different colors that he, he wore with, with pride because his father had given it to just him out of all the brothers. Um, there was 12 of them all together with Joseph. And so, you know, this is how he had lived up to this point. Um, probably hadn't experienced really any hardships or trials, but that completely changes now. Right? And so what we'll see is for the next several years as well, he experiences trials, tribulation, suffering um, in the form of slavery again, as we have already seen, and then prison too, which will happen, or, or we read about at the end of this chapter. Um, and again, this wasn't because he did something to deserve it either, right? Um, he may have been boastful to his brothers, uh, naively so, uh, but that didn't warrant being sold into slavery. Um, and so again, maybe at this point, when Joseph finds himself in this situation, this new situation, in this new role, in this new job, again, it's not a great job or any job that he would have voluntarily taken, 
but he could have been asking that question quite often. Why is this happening to me? Why? God, why are you putting me through this? Why are you allowing this to, to take place in my life? Okay. Maybe uh, some of us, maybe not to that degree, but we still often struggle with that whenever you know trials or suffering or something unexpected come in our lives. Or maybe it's that role that we're in, um, that status that we feel like we should have but we don't have, and right now we have this status. And, and maybe we begin to you know, question We begin to wonder why, or maybe we even start getting, you know, I don't know, defeated too, thinking like, I guess this is my lot in life, or this is what's going to, you know, this is, this is all that's going to happen in my life as well, right? We can do that. Um, But Joseph didn't do any of those things, and uh, we see why. And so, yes, in the beginning of this chapter, we see him as an Egyptian slave, but as we read verse 2, we see something very important about the situation, about what's happening behind the scenes. Verse 2 says, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And if you paid attention as we're reading the rest of this chapter earlier, you would have seen similar words to this. We see similar words to this throughout the chapter. The Lord was with Joseph, but the Lord was with Joseph, and he experienced success. And so we see how in, in, in God, or in God's eyes, and because God is with him, Joseph is a successful man. We know that his job, his status, his role in terms of the circumstances of life is an Egyptian slave, but in God's eyes, and with what God is doing, because God is with him, no, in fact, Joseph is a successful man. We see success in his life. Why? Because the Lord was with him. Because the Lord was with him. So in spite of the trials, in spite of the hardships, in spite of his situation as a slave, the Lord is with him. And what happens? We see immediately God's presence in his life. It brings favor, success, blessing. And not even just for Joseph, too. That's also what we're told immediately. It's not just for him, but it's for the people that he serves as well. And specifically, in this case, for his Egyptian master, for Potiphar. So what we also see here is that those outside the covenant people, those outside the ones that God has chosen in in Jacob and then now Joseph and, you know, the, the Israelites to be, outside of them, people are being blessed. People like Potiphar and his household, and then we'll even see the whole nation of Egypt in a way, because the Lord is with Joseph. Because the Lord is blessing him. Okay. Um, and so we see this, uh, this, this theme, these words throughout the life of Joseph. The Lord was with him. And as that happens, he, he rises even in the ranks of, of the Egyptian you know, uh, hierarchy and, and, and their government. Um, it's not smooth, but he does because God is with him. Okay. Um, so what we also see, too, in verse 3 is that uh, his master sees that the Lord is with him. And that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed. So Joseph finds favor in Potiphar's eyes as well. He recognizes that the Lord is with this this young man as well. And that God is bringing success to this young man. So one of the questions I had as reading this was, you know, was Potiphar a God-fearer? Was he someone who worshipped God in some way? Even though he didn't truly or fully know the God of Israel Uh, perhaps, but did he worship God in some way? We don't get any indication of that, perhaps, but I doubt it. Then how did he recognize that the Lord was with Joseph? Because what we read here is he saw that Joseph was successful in all that he did and all that his hands did, and then he attributed that to a higher power. He attributed that to someone beyond Joseph. Um, So we see, and and Potiphar himself sees the success of Joseph, that Joseph is a successful man, young man, in all that he does. But he sees and he senses that the success is not to be credited to Joseph himself, but to be towards God, towards the Lord, towards this higher power that Potiphar may not even know himself really or fully. Interesting, right? But we see this in, in Joseph's life. He's a successful man, but his success is why? Well, one... His success is credited to God and not himself or anyone else. His success is credited to God and not himself or anyone else. 
um, perhaps Joseph to Potiphar, uh, you know, to his master, he, he spoke of God, perhaps. He, he might have uh, shared about his own commitment to the Lord. Uh, maybe, maybe Potiphar even asked him, said, young man, you know, you're 17, you're 18, um, you're good at what you do and the way you go about your business and, you know, and, and as you have been overseeing my household and you've been doing things, you know, there's, there's more and more blessing that is coming. You know, what's going on? Why is this happening? Do you know? And perhaps in those moments, if Joseph was asked, he, he said, look, Potiphar, you know, master, it's, it's, it's not me. It really isn't. Everything that is being accomplished, it's because of God. It's because the Lord is with me. He's doing these things through me. Um, but perhaps that wasn't enough for Potiphar. Right? Like he didn't really believe that perhaps. Or he was like, okay, kid, you know, maybe you went to church or whatever. But you really, you know, is this really the case? Um, and, and the fact that uh, Joseph displayed these giftings, you know, uh, leadership or wisdom or administration. You know, but, this, but he was still only a, a teen. Perhaps Potiphar, upon seeing, you know, these giftings and the success of Joseph, he too then had to conclude, it's no, there's no way that even if you had these gifts, even if you had these abilities, that you could be using them in such a, you know, efficient way or such a powerful way at this point. You're still too young. You don't have any experience. You know, you don't have any life experience. I mean, he was betrayed by his brothers and slaves, so that's a life experience. But you don't have time to grow. You know, you haven't had time to mature. So how are all these things happening? So even if he knew these things, Potiphar was probably thinking, it can't be this kid. It can't be. It has to be someone else. It has to be something else. And so credit was given to God, right? God was the only one who could be responsible to make this young man as successful as he was. God is giving him success. How refreshing is that? You know, in our day and age, you know, there's a lot of uh, successful young people. Um, there's a lot of, when I, mean, when I say that, I mean people that, you know, try to make a name for themselves in, in our society in some way. There's a lot of talented people, obviously, um, and um, a lot of people who are trying to show off their talents, right? Um, sometimes they may not be that talented as well, but there are a lot of talented people that are discovered because they're wanting to show off their talents so much. And uh, they may give a nod to God. You know, you may hear them say, like, you know, I'm blessed by God. You know, it's, it's from God. But you can also tell that they are seeking ultimately, for the most part, their own glory, right? Looking to make a name for themselves in, 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 in some capacity. What if people saw your life, right? Regardless of how talented you are, what kind of abilities you have. But what if people saw your life and whatever success is coming through your life? And it's not just, I don't mean just monetary or even status, but it could include those things, right? But whatever they see in your life and they consider that there's some sense of success or um, things that are taking place in your life, a fruit that's coming from your life. What if they were to see that and they were to say, that must be God. Oh, it must be God. Like, I know you. You know, you're not that talented or you're not that gifted. And so the only way that this can be happening is because there's a higher power working in your life. Would you be okay with that? Would you? Would you truly be okay with that if God got all the credit? You could say, well, yeah, I went to this school. But you know what? Even the fact that you could go to that school was because God blessed you with the mind, the the brain that you have, the ability to write, well, you know what, I stayed up to three in the morning, and I, I, I had all-nighters, and I studied really hard, and that's good. We are supposed to do that. But again, would you give that credit, all of the credit to God? Right? You know, I was really encouraged by um, a small thing, but something that uh, someone shared with me about how, you know, has, this person has been going through some changes in their lives, and, and, and God is at work in, this, pers- in this, this person's life. And so there's been transformation that's taken place. And to, to the outside, to those that have known this person, um, but, you know, don't really know God, um, they have seen this person's life, and they've noticed the change. They've noticed success in that sense, or differences, right, a growth, um, and uh, transformation, and so they want to attribute that to something. So I think one of this person's friends said something like, oh, it must be because of these other relationships that you have now. It must be because be- people have influenced you and people have been, you know, changing or, or, or doing things to, to help you change. Right? And, and there's some truth to that, I think. But what was really encouraging was how this person felt so um, like God was wronged when he was not getting the credit. 
And, and so this person felt like, you know, I want whoever sees my life to know that the reason why there's anything that's taking place in my life is because God has been working, because God has been bringing that change, because he is the one and he alone is the one who gets credit for any transformation, any success in my life. And what I was so encouraged by, it was a small thing, really, but was just the, the sense of um, responsibility, nah, not so much responsibility, but, but the sense of like this bothered this person so much that someone else, even a good person, even a person that may have helped, would get some of the credit or some of the glory that God only deserved. Right? And, and so when I saw that, I was like, okay, this person recognizes that, yes, you know, the church can help. Yes, individuals can help. But ultimately, it is God who does this work in our lives, and we want him to get all the glory and credit for what takes place in our lives. And to be actually, like, vigilant and to be jealous for God's glory in that way was, was encouraging. And I think that's what Joseph would have wanted to. He would have wanted to make sure that any success in his life, anything that was credited to him, would have been given to God, would have been given to him, to him alone. So Potiphar also recognizes, or is smart enough perhaps, uh, to recognize that Joseph should be given more responsibility. He doesn't let his pride get in the way. He doesn't see Joseph as a threat, which also takes some humility. But instead, what does he do? He entrusts uh, to Joseph um, the, the ability or the power to oversee his whole household. But we also see this, too, that uh, Joseph's success is not the result so much of his ability, but is more the result of his character and his integrity. The reason why Potiphar trusts him to oversee the whole household is not just because what Joseph has done is successful, but ultimately it's because he can trust this young man. If he could not trust this young man, he would not give him this responsibility or this authority um, over his house. Um, It wasn't just about what he could do. And so he puts him in charge of the whole house because he sees the integrity that Joseph possesses, even though he's young. And so he trusts him. And then as a result of that trust, then as Joseph is, you know, put in charge of the whole house, then we see that God blesses the household. Um, The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Um, Again, we see how uh, the the writer of of Genesis um, makes sure to specifically say that uh, Potiphar was an Egyptian, a non-Jew, you know, a Gentile. Because they also wanted to make it clear that God's covenant blessing to God's people, Abraham, and then, you know, Isaac and Jacob, and now Joseph, was not just for their people, for the Israelites. But it was, Abraham was blessed, you know, Genesis 12 too, to be a blessing to others. And so we also see how Joseph's success, if you will, ultimately blesses others. It bless, it ultimately, his success blesses others. And so, in this case, it's an Egyptian, you know, those outside his covenant people, um, and and we're called to do the same. Any success that we are given, any ways that God blesses us, we are called then now as his covenant people to be a blessing to those outside the covenant, that they may know him. So things are good for Potiphar. Things are good for Joseph, even up to this point, even though he's still a slave. Things are good for Potiphar's household. There's more prosperity and blessing than ever before. Now, before we get to the next part, which I think we're more familiar with in terms of this story, this chapter, you know, Potiphar's wife, Mrs. Potiphar, uh, I just want to address quickly, why was the Lord with Joseph? Why is the Lord with Joseph? Is there some reasons to that? You know, and even the, uh, the success that Joseph experienced. Were there some reasons for that, right? And I think there are. Um, there are reasons why the Lord is with Joseph, as we're told repeatedly in this chapter. One reason is because Joseph is chosen by God. Okay? He's chosen by God. Right? And again, you've been hearing that word. You've been hearing me say it throughout Genesis as well. We see God's sovereignty, you know, in Esau and Jacob. We see it in Joseph and amongst his brothers. Um, we... we, we you know, we see it. We just see it throughout in, in, in the covenants and, and those who are blessed um, in, in the midst of the family that God chooses to bless. Um, but in Joseph, we see the same thing. You know, he's rejected. He's rejected by men. 
In this case, he's rejected by his own brothers, but he's chosen by God. He's chosen by God. Okay? He's chosen by God um, to fulfill his purposes, but we see again God's choosing of Joseph. Um, and like I mentioned, throughout the whole story of Joseph and even in this chapter, we do see a difference in Joseph in the sense that he seems to seek to live a righteous life. He seems to try to um, obey God in the way that he lives, right, and the things that he does and the choices that he makes. But it's not because Joseph is striving to live a righteous life that he is first chosen by God. We need to, we need to distinguish that. It's not because he is living a righteous life that God then says, now I will choose you. No, God has already chosen him. God has already chosen him. God already has his purposes. God is already with him in this sense. It's God's grace and his mercy again that we see. So that's the first thing. We see how God is with Joseph because he is chosen by God. And then secondly, we see how he is used by God, how he is used by God. God is with Joseph because he is to be used by God. By God. You know, God's purposes for Joseph are to be fulfilled. And in Joseph's case, the purpose that God has for him, the ultimate purpose that God has for Joseph is to save and reconcile the covenant family. Um, You know, Israel, you know, this covenant family, Jacob, you know, his sons, Jacob, remember, became Israel. Uh, his family, the, the family that, that, Jacob, uh, that Joseph is a part of, and his brothers have broken up this family by selling him and then devastating their father by saying that he's dead now, right? Um, but God's purpose for Joseph, though, is that he's going to be used by him to, to save and to reconcile this family and then ultimately to save and to continue um, the, the people of Israel for God's further purposes, so that's why the Lord is with Joseph as well, because he has purposes for him. He has the sovereign purpose for his life, and because God is with him. And then I think the last reason why the Lord is with Joseph is because he is obedient to God. But notice the order, and I want to just, again, say that because it is important. It's first because he's chosen by God you know, for God's purposes. And then we see Joseph's life and his response that he obeys God. It's not reversed. It's not because he's obedient to God that God chooses him and then decides to use him, right? It's actually first that God has chosen him. God has, you know, in that sense, saved him. And he has his purposes for for Joseph. And Joseph, in response to God being with him, to God working in his life, trusts the Lord. He obeys the Lord, right? Um, And his obedience and righteousness shows that he truly trusts God or that he trusts God fully. Okay. And so we see that about Joseph too. So I don't want to say that God being with a person has nothing to do with how we live our lives or the choices we make. Of course it does. And our obedience to him. If we're disobedient and we do our own thing and, and God says this is sin and we do it and God says this is righteousness and he wants us to do this and we don't, then that has ramifications. Yes, the Bible is clear about that. But again, the choosing of God, God's grace in Joseph's life is already there. God's mercy in his life is already there. God's purpose in Joseph's life is there. And as a response to God's grace and his mercy and his purposes for Joseph, Joseph obeys. Right? Joseph responds to that, just like we are too as well to the gospel that God has saved us through, if you are a Christian. Okay? Now, Joseph's life is different um, from, for example, his father Jacob. You know, Joseph doesn't deceive and he doesn't live for himself as Jacob did for much of his life. You know, Joseph also doesn't have to wrestle with God. Um, he does endure suffering. Uh, he does endure trials. And as we see in this chapter, he endures temptation. But we also see this about Joseph, which I appreciate, that his obedience was, was great. His obedience was true. And through these trials and through these tribulations, he learns greater obedience and greater trust. And so, in fact... The cool thing about Joseph is that there's actually some parallels to Jesus' life in Joseph's story. Right? I know that's, that's a lofty goal. So let's just say there's some comparisons, there's parallels. This doesn't mean that you know, Joseph is like Jesus, but we do see some of those. You know? um, Joseph is loved by his father, like Jesus is. You know, he's rejected by his brothers, like Jesus was rejected by men, including his own disciples. 
Uh, Joseph was sold and betrayed for silver, just as Jesus was. Uh, Joseph was tempted. He suffers unfairly and then ultimately saves the covenant family and is reconciled to them. I just want us to know this, guys. We don't want to get to that point, too, where in our lives as Christians, on one hand, you know, we, we hear about grace so much. We hear about God's love. And maybe we even hear about God choosing us. And it, hasn't, it doesn't have to do with us. I don't want us to get comfortable, apathetic, and like, well, okay, God's chosen me. God showed me grace. It doesn't really matter what I do. It doesn't really matter how I live. Right? On the other hand, I don't want us to also be so consumed with, like, it's my righteousness. It's my obedience that gets God to accept me. You know, if I'm a good Christian, if I'm this, I'm this, then God will love me. God will accept me more because that's not the gospel either. But I do want us to see positive, powerful examples of those who are transformed by God's grace, by his choosing, by his purposes. And because they know that more deeply and they trust him more fully, they walk in greater and greater obedience and righteousness in their lives. And as they do that, God uses them more. God does more through them as well. We do need to see examples like that. And we see that in Joseph. Right? And this is then what we should be seeking to become like too in that sense. We should want to become more and more obedient to him as we trust him more and more fully. That's what's happening in Joseph's life. And this, throughout his life, there's this remainder, there's this refrain that the Lord is with him, that the Lord is with him. I don't know about you, but I, I pray if you truly are a Christian, that you would desire that one of the testimonies in your life would be continually, not just for a season of your life, but that the Lord is with you, that the Lord is with you, and, and that in your life you're experiencing more and more of the fruit and the success that he wants to bring through us as we seek to obey him, as we seek to trust him all the more. Right? And so what we see next is how uh, Joseph, in his obedience uh, to the Lord being with him, how he also then, in the midst of not just trials and suffering, but in the midst of temptation and sin, how he resists, how he resists. Okay? And so this is important for us to see and know as well, because uh, we face this all the time. So you, you notice a, a, a slight, like, in the middle of verse 6. It happens in the, in the middle or towards the end of this verse, but it's like a shift in what takes place. Um, it says, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And then verse 7, and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. Right? So... Now what happens? Well, he's, he's taken, uh, he's in charge over Potiphar's household, um, and then temptation comes his way. And uh, trial comes his way in the form of temptation. Perhaps by this time, maybe he's uh, 19, maybe he's 20. Again, he's still young, uh, but he's handsome. You know? and, and it says uh, he's, he's handsome in form and appearance. The way I read that, I'm not sure, but it means he's just not good looking here, but you know, his body, his form you know, is, 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 is nice, is good. He's, he's manly, he's you know, whatever you want to put there, but, but he, he's put together, he's put together. Okay? And so Potiphar's wife um, you know, has watched him for a while around the house, you know, doing chores, et cetera, you know, this and that, and uh, she casts her eyes on him. She casts her eyes on him, right? Um, so she wants him. She, she desires him. She starts lusting after him. And because she has authority and power, she's like, I'm going to get him. So, so what does she do? Well, basically, you know, uh, she says to him, lie with me, sleep with me, right? And uh, what does he do? He refuses, verse 8. And, and he says, you know, it's not, I'm, I'm resisting your advances, not just because of what your husband has entrusted me with in terms of being overseer of this house, which is, again, very responsible and wise for his age or beyond his age. But notice what he also says, too. He gives those reasons, right? He says, I can't do this because of what my master has done and how he trusts me. Um, but then he also says um, at the end of verse 9, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God, right? So, yes, I don't want to betray my master's trust, Potiphar's trust, because of all the, the responsibility and trust he's shown me, you know. Um, but more than that, more importantly, I cannot, I refuse to sin against God. I refuse to sin against God. But that doesn't um, stop Mrs. Potiphar. And, and seriously, you know, as I was reading this too, I mean, if I'm being completely honest, 
as I was reading this, I was like, what if I was in that situation? You know, take back 20 or so years, um, more than that. But when I was like early 20s or something like that, or maybe my like, and, and you guys know, and you know even still, you know, regardless of what your age may be, especially men, like, you know, hormones going crazy and He's, he's in a foreign country, no family, no nothing. I'm sure he desires companionship. I'm sure he's lonely, all these things. And you see a woman, and we don't know what she looks like, whatever. But, you know, we see a woman that's throwing herself at him, right? What would you do? What would you do? Right? Um, he's a young man with hormones. Um, they're in the privacy of their own, this home. Her husband's gone every single day to work. And day after day, she is beckoning him. Seriously. We don't know how long this was going on for, but perhaps months. Men, would you resist such temptation day after day? And then I thought of the fact that, you know what? He has nowhere to go, right? He's a slave. It's not like he could go, I'm just going to go get another job. You know, this, 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 this boss's wife, oh, she's too much. I, I can't, you know, I can't take this. I got to just get out of here. Um, I know it's a good job and the master trusts me, but I cannot do this. I refuse to do this. No, he lacks the freedom to do that. He's still a slave, right? He can't just go and do something else. Yet we see day after day, he resists her seduction and he commits in his heart and with his mind, with his eyes to not sin against the Lord. And he's 20, (laughs) you know, Um, that's something that really is. And so we see his obedience to to the Lord and his desire. This is the obedience that says, I will not sin against you. I refuse to sin against you. It's not the obedience that says, like, okay, I'm going to do this for you, God. That's important. But it's the obedience that says, I'm going to resist. I'm going to say no to sin. As I was thinking about Potiphar's wife, Potiphar's wife as well, reminded me of, uh, like, the Proverbs. In Proverbs, like Proverbs 7, there's, um, there's Proverbs about the forbidden woman, the adulteress, how she tempts the young man, um, the young man who lacks sense. Um, and she tempts him with flattery and boldness, kind of like Potiphar's wife did, right? And, and it's all around, and we see Joseph resist. Now, for you who are young men as well, and again, I know that these things that we've been talking about when it comes to, you know, sexual temptation in the, in the context of the Bible, in, in what we've been reading in Genesis, it, it applies more, I think, to the struggle that men can have with, with this area. Um, But it doesn't negate or doesn't mean that women can't have this too. Okay, so I hope if you're a woman and you struggle with sexual temptation as well, that that's something that you can see in in, in the word too and and take from as well. But but again, for for young men, let me say, um, or for women, um, you may not have someone in your life right now to seduce you kind of like Potiphar's wife was, like in the flesh. But again, men, I know this. There are many different women trying to seduce you that are on your screens, that are on your phones, that are in your mind, right? And the thing is, for you, they come in various sizes and shapes, redheaded, whatever, brunette, this and this. There's a lot of different variety as well. And and, and there's that seduction. There's that seducing that takes place. And they beckon you to sin against God. And so we're reminded here again, will you resist? Will you have integrity of heart? In this area. And we see that Joseph does. He withstands this temptation. And again, I wanted to make you see how much temptation he was enduring in the midst of that. But he resists because he says, I refuse to sin against God. Well, Mrs. Potiphar, she won't stop. And so not not only her words are being used now, physically she tries to catch him this time. You know, this is the same thing about sin and temptation that we need to be honest about. We have to always be on guard because it will always continue to try to woo us some way, shape, or form. Right? Um, and so when there's no one in the house, she sees an opportunity, and she literally grabs him. Right? She grabs his arm, and then she says, lie with me. And then what does he do? Damn. I mean, this, you know, he doesn't say, okay, you got me finally, you know, whatever and stuff. He, uh, he, he runs. He runs. Right? He runs. And as he does, his garment, whatever he was wearing, it comes off. And then we see what she does. You know, she's angry perhaps because she's been refused so many times. Or maybe she's fearful uh, of being suspected of impropriety herself. So she claims that Joseph tried to rape her. 
Um, and she tells the, the people that are working, the other men and the other people in the house, like, this is what happened, this is what happened. And then she repeats that same story to her husband, to Potiphar, later. Right? But Joseph, what does he do? He ran. Right? We don't know where he ran to. We know that he left the house for sure. But it also seems like he didn't actually go too far. Or in other words, he didn't run away. Right? So this is interesting because he ran from her. But we still see his integrity because he didn't run away from his responsibilities. That's also really like, wow, Joseph, like, you're a young man and this has happened. So you run. You got to get out of the house. But I don't think he just said, like, I'm just going to go and, you know, forget this. Like, he still was responsible in his role, in his job, right? Um, And so he remains perhaps on the grounds of Potiphar's house, uh, maybe the property. And then once Potiphar hears his wife's story, you know, and he gets upset, then he has Joseph arrested and put into prison. Okay. You know, there seems to be no resistance in Joseph, too. Maybe he just didn't have a choice because he was a slave. But we don't see that. We don't read that. And, and given Joseph and his integrity of heart, um, I don't think he actually tried to, like, say, no, 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 this is really what happened. I mean, maybe, but it doesn't seem that case. Um, and with his lack of rights, probably, or maybe he thought, you know, what's, what's the point, too? But uh, he knows what happened. And he knows what the truth is, right? And in that sense, that's good enough for him, even in this situation. So he takes the punishment, even though he may not deserve it, he takes that, right, in his integrity as well, and in perhaps his trust of the Lord over his life. But you know what's interesting, though, is that um, even though he's put into prison, the fact that he's put into prison shows some grace or shows that the Lord is with him too. Because one, attempting to rape One's master's wife as a slave likely in this culture and in many cultures would have resulted in death. It's like, you know, you did that, you're a slave, you're a servant, and you tried to attack the the wife of the master's house. You know, it's not prison. You know, you're dead, right? But that doesn't happen. And we also see that the prison that he's actually confined to is where the king's prisoners are. This is another way to actually say likely that this was like a white-collar prison, you know? This is, this is where people get treated better, um, and that there's more leniency, and we'll see that in the next chapter. So it seems that Potiphar, for whatever reason, is lenient with Joseph too. Right? Maybe it's because, you know, he saw that God was with Joseph, and maybe he likes the kid too, and he's like, this kid has been so great, I've never had someone like him. Maybe also he actually kind of knew his wife and was like, I don't know if I could completely trust her, perhaps too. But I think the biggest reason still was God was with him, because that's what we're told. But the Lord was with him, right? And then so in verse 21, even after he's put into prison, what does it say? But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And so just like Potiphar's household, Joseph ends up being put in charge of all the prisoners. And then the warden's like, I give you complete trust. You know, Joseph, I trust you. You run it. I don't even need to do my job because I trust you now, right? That kind of favor. But we see that again. But the Lord was with Joseph. But the Lord was with Joseph. You know, I've said this before, but uh, I'll repeat it, and maybe I haven't said it for a while, but every time there's a but in the Bible, or oftentimes when there's a but in the Bible, we need to pay close attention, right? We should be paying close attention to the buts of the Bible in that sense because they bring such good news, ultimately, right? And uh, one, they always tell us first of our predicament, right? Our condition and um, the hopeless situation that we are in uh, in and of ourselves, right? Um, so Ephesians chapter 2 has this big but in Ephesians 2, 4, because preceding Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 is how we were dead in our trespasses, how we're spiritually dead, you know, how we went with the ways of this world and we, we followed the, the, you know, the, the, the spirit of this age and talking about, you know, all those things that, that we are dead in and our sinfulness. And then in verse 4, it says, but God, who is rich in mercy, has saved you now in Christ, right? So, the, the first thing that we're told of whenever there's a but is it points us to what our predicament was or what our situation was apart from God. And then it gives us hope because of what God has done and continues to do in our lives. So, in Joseph's case, up to this point, Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers. 
but the Lord is with him. So he's not, he doesn't die. His life is not lost. The Lord is with him. He ends up in an Egyptian captain's home as a lowly slave, but the Lord is with him, and he becomes overseer of all the household. He is tempted again and again by Potiphar's wife, but the Lord is with him as he sets his heart to not sin against God, and he resists. He is falsely accused and thrown into prison. Seems unfair. But the Lord is with him and shows him his steadfast love and favor, and he experiences that in prison as well. This is the but that applies to those of us who are in Christ. And I hope you have experienced that in some capacity, and I hope we continue to do in greater capacities. But do we trust that he is with us in this way? That in whatever situation and things that come, his steadfast love is truly over our lives. Again, this doesn't mean we won't end up in hard places. You know, it doesn't mean that there won't be suffering and trials, sickness, whatever it may be. But if God is with us, we can trust him, and we can show that we trust him um, through our obedience to him, Right? In, in doing what he asks us to, as well as resisting what he tells us to resist and say no to as well, because he's with us, right? but the Lord is with us, right? and that's what Joseph did. Um, he trusted him. He trusted that God was with him. Um, he resisted sin, and Jesus did the same. Right? Jesus didn't give in to temptation. He resisted sin to the point of the shedding of blood so that ultimately he could be that perfect sacrifice for us and for our own sinfulness. And he gives us the strength to do the same, not in the sense that we're going to never sin or we're always going to obey, but that as we continue to grow in him, we experience more and more that the Lord is with us and he is working in and through us. And so we see that in Joseph's life, and that's something that God wants to do in each of us. The Lord is with us. And he gives us then success, not in terms of, you know, our, 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 uh, the, the worldly view and whatever the world says success is, but in terms of in God's eyes. Right? He makes us then, you know, fruitful in that way. And that's what he desires to do for us. So let's pray. Father, um, thank you for the example of Joseph. Thank you for the life of Joseph. Um, I know throughout the book of Genesis, there's a lot of... Uh, Real life examples, um, there's a lot of human failure and sinfulness that we see in some of these men and women 